Hello, everyone, and welcome to Long for Truth. My name is Daniel Long, and as you can see, uh, I have a special guest joining me all the way from South Africa. This is Gerard Stander. Gerard uh, and I uh, struck up a conversation about a year or so ago, and we started talking through Facebook Messenger and uh, developed a friendship, and uh, we've been talking ever since. And he sent me his testimony, uh, how he came out of the charismatic movement. And I'm sure it's going to be edifying and very helpful to those who are in the same predicament that he was uh, several years ago. So, uh, Gerard, hello. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hey, Daniel, thank you. Thanks for having me. It's a great privilege. And um, it's nice to talk to the person that I usually look at talking to <laughs> people about things. It's yeah. very important. Exactly. So thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And so, like I said, uh, you sent me your testimony. I don't know. It's been uh, three, two or three months ago, maybe three months ago. And um, something like that. Yeah. And I, I got a hold of you. And I said, look, this is a really good story. I think it'll be really helpful for people. Let's let's get together and talk about maybe coming on the show and just, um, you know, sharing that with others, because you were formerly in the charismatic uh, movement. And um and now you're out and you're going to a, a very, you know, solid church and you're, you're learning the word of yeah. God. And, and so that's, that, that's just, that's amazing. So, uh, but before we get to your story, why don't you tell the folks a little bit about, uh, you know, where you're from, what you do for a living, uh, you know, and, and all that stuff. So they get to know you some. Right. Yeah. So, uh, I'm from South Africa. I, uh, stay in Cape town currently. And um, I teach music, teach guitar primarily. I've been playing guitar for roughly 30 years. Um, so yeah, uh, electric guitar is my passion. And I try to help people as much as I can to, to reach their goals and potential in that sense. And uh, yeah, very grateful to God for it, for the talent and the ability to do it. Music is an awesome thing. Mm -hmm. Really enjoy it. And um, yeah, so that's, that's me in a nutshell. All right, Gerard. So let's uh, let's go ahead and uh, talk about your uh, your early life, how you became a charismatic, what attracted you to the charismatic movement, and um, and then we'll just transition on how uh, you got out of it. And let's also one of the things I also want to do, and I, I forgot to mention this in the very beginning here, is that uh, let's talk about your uh, experience with tongues. Let's make sure we get that in there because um, uh, it, it was. It was a um, a big deal for you, and it's a huge uh, deal in the charismatic movement. As a matter of fact, um, in my opinion, tongues seem to be elevated more than anything else, any of the other gifts, other, you know, in, in, in the majority of the charismatic movement. Am I correct about that? Yes, I would say so. I would say the big issue um, that tongues is kind of the, the, the spear end of mm -hmm. the spear there, and the, 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 the thrust of the spear would be unless you have a living, personal, tangible, back and forth, communicative relationship with God or living relationship with mm -hmm. God in that sense, uh, you don't really have the fullness of God or you're, you're kind of maybe switched on, maybe you're saved, but you are lacking yeah. uh, in your walk with God. Yeah, That's because, yeah, because um, in order to have that evidence that you've actually been baptized in with the Holy Spirit, you have to speak in tongues. Is that what uh, your church taught? Pretty much. That was the inference. Uh, that was the inference that if you don't speak in tongues, then it's doubtful whether you have received the Holy Spirit. Although the church I was in would say you have the Holy Spirit, you can do it, just start talking. That yeah. would be typically the approach. Gotcha. All right. So, uh, Gerard, why don't you go ahead and just you know start telling us uh, you know how you... Uh, became a Christian, and then how you got involved in the charismatic movement. Okay. So, um, yeah, uh, as a kid, my, my dad, my sister, my mother would read me the Bible accounts. I remember uh, seeing in the children's Bible, you know, a portrayal of Jesus on the cross and thinking to myself, you know, that, that really had to hurt. And, you know, <laughs> did he actually do that for my sins? You know, mm. so from a small age that impression was made on me that jesus died for my sins that he is truly god he's truly the son of god i think i realized those things um in a behind the scenes kind of a way yeah. uh yeah. later on i expressly looked into the deity of christ of course but um 
yeah, so from a young age, I believed that the Bible was God's word. I, I understood that God was God. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are God. And I understood that from a young age. Um, in my teens, I got exposed mostly to charismatic type uh, type things. Uh, Jeff Fennelt uh, used to have a TV program on TBN. Um, you know, he was the lead singer for Black Sabbath at a stage, and he got saved. Whether he's truly saved, I'm not sure. But he was singing worship songs on stage and singing in tongues and things like that. So there was already a kind of a plug hole for that type of idea, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so anyway. <clears throat> When I got saved uh, at school, age 16, um, my friend who kind of uh, influenced me was walking with his Bible on the school grounds and he was uh, rebuking people for cussing. And I thought that was <laughs> quite cool because, you know, there's some, someone living out his Christianity, which was relatively foreign to me. Um, I grew up very nominally mm. in a nominal type of a Christian way. So anyway, um, I started rebuking my friends back home for their cussing because I, I had a really foul mouth uh, and I stopped, you know, by God's grace, I was able to stop. So Ephesians 5 was the text that my friend at school used uh, to rebuke people. You know, um, I think it's the one that says, let no corrupt speech come out of your mouth. Mm -hmm. um, and also uh, it said, uh, coarse jesting, sexual immorality, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints. And so that was the text he used primarily to rebuke people. Um, and that struck me. Um, and so anyway, long story short, I started witnessing to my friends at home. And um, I said, guys, stop cussing, man, it offends Jesus. And the one guy said to me, shut up, man. And he actually cussed me out. And he said, <laughs> you know, if off and go home. <laughs> yeah, he said. Um, so, so um, so basically, I said to them, no, I will not shut up for Jesus. Because at that stage, I had a very guilty conscience uh, being a being a rebellious teenager and, you know, just all kinds of rebellion as a teenager that, that was convicting me. And um, so I went home and I thought to myself, I did something good. I, I stood up for Christ and that's right. Um, and I thought to myself, does this mean that I'm going to heaven when I die? You know, that was my thought. Mm. So I thought to myself, let me read the Bible. Let me, let me see if God is wanting to say something to me. Um, and so I opened my Bible to uh, Ephesians 2, sorry, not Ephesians, to, to Timothy, 2 Timothy mm. 2. And it said, uh, so you, my son, be strong in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the things that you've heard from me, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You therefore, as a loyal soldier of Christ Jesus, must endure hardship. When I read that, I thought, hey, wait a minute. I just endured hardship for Christ and for the name of Christ. And here I'm reading this in God's word. God must have seen what just happened. And he's talking to me. That was kind of my thinking. And so I thought to myself, does this mean I'm going to heaven when I die? Because that was the big issue. And uh, just a while before that, I think a couple of months before that, maybe, I prayed and I said one night, I said, Lord, I don't know if I'm, uh, if I'm one of your sheep, if I'm one of yours. But I, I know I should be and I want to be. Please make me born again in Jesus' name. That was basically my simple prayer. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think a month or two or three after that, this happened. Okay. So um, yeah, so I, I obviously began my journey there. Um, God delivered me from you know being, you know, just a lying, thieving, cussing teenager. Um, so it, it was a big thing for me because those sins particularly stopped in my life and uh, I felt very confident. I, I had a joy in my life that, 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 that started being there after being a very repressed and depressed kid. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's, that's where I uh, got into Christianity pretty much. That was my entrance into Christianity. And from there on, I was quite influenced by charismatic uh, people and charismatic thoughts and doctrine. So, um, of course, the tongues thing. Uh, not too long after uh, getting into a specific uh, charismatic congregation here in Cape Town, um, not too long after that, of course, I started thinking to myself, hey, but these people speak in tongues, and I also want to speak in tongues. And if I'm really honest with myself, what really lured me about that was the specialness of it. You know, it's going to make me special. I'm going to have this special power, you know, mm. <laughs> if I can speak in tongues, and it's going to be people can't explain it and blah, 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 you know, that kind of motive. Yeah. Um, so uh, why don't why don't you why don't we talk about that a little bit? Now you say it can kind of give you a special power. What what exactly do you mean by special power there? 
all my thinking was this is something that I suppose no one would be able to explain. It's going to distinguish me. Those, mm -hmm. those were my, I think, internal thoughts about it, really. Let me ask um, you this. Was it something of an assurance thing, too, that say, thinking, OK, if I have the gift of tongues, if I can speak in tongues, then it must really mean that I have the Holy Spirit um, and maybe even possibly and, and maybe other charismatics do the same thing, looking for that assurance of salvation. Because look, we, we all sin, right? We, even as Christians, yeah, we, we sin, we struggle, yeah. we, we, you know, we fall. And um, not that we are, you know, practicing and, and continuing to, to, to uh, you know, think that, hey, I can just sin and live any way I want, but we struggle with sin. Yeah. There's a fight there. There's a battle that takes place, and we often fail. Luther said we yeah. sin often, we sin much, you know, um, yeah, and we, uh, we sin daily. And uh, so... You know, having some kind of visible sign that I have the Holy Spirit, um, it could be something like a, a a sacrament, so to speak, within the charismatic movement, uh, saying, "Hey, you yeah. know, uh, if I if I speak in tongues, that shows that I I'm a genuine Christian." Could that be something that was going on in your mind, or uh, do you think that's something that takes place in a lot of people's minds? I think um, it, it wasn't as much of an assurance factor for mm. me because for me, the assurance factor had to do with God's righteousness. Thankfully, it mm. had to do with the fact that I must repent of sin. I understood that early on. Good. Um, but the, the because of the way that I saw Christianity portrayed until then, it kind of, it sorry, it kind of came part and parcel of Christianity. And, and I think that's a big danger uh, yeah. because you associate something that's added to Christianity and not mm. necessarily biblical. You associate that with Christianity and with Orthodox biblical truth. Yeah. And so that was more the idea for me is it's is I thought it's this um special ability that God gives you. Uh yeah. Yeah. And, so, and, and I was enamored by the ability. Then it would distinguish you, maybe, uh it kind of make you yeah. stand out. Okay. All right. So yeah. uh all right. So you began to uh uh talk to the Lord about uh maybe speaking in tongues yourself. I I didn't necessarily. I think I may have asked for it. I'm not sure, but uh, I do remember. I do remember this: that one day I was sitting on my bed and just praising God, just just saying, "I praise you, Lord," and just being thankful. I was, you know, just feeling really joyful, and just saying, "Praise you, Lord." And obviously, uh, having a new faith in Christ and realizing that this is now actual faith in Jesus, mm -hmm. uh, it was it was new to me, and it was exciting, and it was good. Um, but anyway, so I was sitting there just worshiping God, and all of a sudden, and I suppose because of my thinking, my, my programming, um, I, I started for a very, very brief moment, this intensely pleasurable, joyful, happy feeling. I couldn't explain it other than to say it was almost an otherworldly uh, joy or a happiness. Mm -hmm. um, it, it started, it kind of bubbled up in a sense, and then it was missing. It was gone. I never, ever felt it again, ever. Um, and I, th I think that was either that day or another day, but one of those days, I just kind of burst out in tongues. It mm -hmm. was very brief. I started speaking just nonsense, and it was very brief, maybe two, three seconds, and then it was also, in a sense, gone. But to keep it going, I would have to make up stuff. To keep it going, I would oh. have to then you know, keep on doing stuff. So I felt, was that the Holy Spirit? I wasn't quite sure, and I suspected that it was the Holy Spirit, right? Mm. So I went to one of the ladies at church. She was the cell leader. And I said to her, please lay hands on me and pray for me. I want to receive the Holy Spirit. I want to speak in tongues. And um, I think I explained to her what happened. She said to me, no, you already have the Holy Spirit. And I said to her, no, but I, I want to speak in tongues. I want the Holy Spirit. And, um, and then she said, okay. And she was reluctant to lay hands on me. Maybe she had some sin in her life or something that she was uncomfortable with because I could see she was trying to get out of laying hands on me. But anyway, so eventually she said, okay, um, you know, God said, if you want the Holy Spirit, he won't give you a false spirit. And obviously that's what scripture teaches that if we, uh, Jesus saying, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Mm -hmm. And so based on that, uh, I plugged into wrong theology. So I used right theology, Jesus' own words, to plug into wrong theology. Um, mm -hmm. 
namely that I can receive this, sorry, <laughs> that I can receive yeah. this nonsensical language that's not going to be of God. Hmm. And uh, anyway, so she prayed for me and she did what every well-trained charismatic does. She said to me, just start repeating syllables. It's just like baby, like a baby learning to speak. Just say it, whether it's ba or ba ba or whatever. Just start saying that. And so, and, um, so let me ask then. So she then must have believed that every Christian had the ability to speak in tongues, correct? I would assume so. Yes. Yeah. I, I would assume so. Now, is that is that something that you were taught uh, in your church that um, you know any Christian can do this? This is something that um, you know every one of us have the ability to do as believers in Christ. Yes. Yeah. So so um, the inference was, uh, especially the second charismatic church that I joined, uh, it was definitely explicitly taught that um, God has a personal prayer language for every Christian. Um, that is tongues. And of course, the inference is that the Holy Spirit gives you the ability to do this. Um, and so that was that was taught. Uh, that was pretty much that was taught what was taught. And I think it's the golden calf of, uh, of Christianity, really, of charismatic Christianity. The golden calf is you must have a personal encounter with the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. and that encounter will be evidenced by you speaking in tongues, um, if not uh, tongues in a prophetic prophetic sense, then at least tongues in a personal prayer capacity sense. The, after that lady prayed for me that day and she left, um, I was sitting there thinking to myself, uh, having this bittersweet kind of a moment, and thinking to myself, okay, it's official. I've got the Holy Spirit. Um, you know. And on the other hand, thinking, but this tongue stuff, it's not happening. I was also quite disappointed uh, at the same time, thinking, but I expected more. I expected mm. some, uh, I don't know, some amazing experience or feeling or, um, you know, some assurance. And I suppose it, being a teenager and having all the, the problems that a teenager has, you know, most teenagers have problems with their identity. I was definitely one of them, you know, problems with, uh, you know, just feeling secure in who you are, that type of thing. Um, and all those anxieties, I think, craved uh, solidness. They mm. craved something that was a, a consolation. And so I think part of the whole motive was I wanted to feel secure and everything. So I was a bit disappointed that I didn't, you know, spontaneously burst out in the same elated experience I experienced in my room uh, a couple of weeks before that, um, or maybe a month. I can't remember the exact distance of time, but something like that. And, um, so I expected some elated, amazing experience. Um, and I then pretty much, after that kind of being prayed for to receive tongues, I pretty much started listening to other people then who also do this. And for a long time, I was literally just swimming in a sea of heresy without realizing it. Um, so yes, the, the lady that discipled me for a while, she was a youth group leader and she discipled me. She picked me up for youth group and, you know, she encouraged me to read scripture and i spent a lot of time reading scripture I, I certainly did that but at the same time i had this idea of now i'm speaking tongues and that connects me to god so I, on the one hand didn't think too deeply about everything and on the other hand did a lot of introspection why am i not feeling this and why am i not feeling that and why isn't it spontaneous i, I think i left it on the back burner um and i just kept on with you know reading scripture and you know the, the normal things of, of a Christian, you know, avoiding unholiness, uh, you know, confessing my sins, those types of things, um, going to church. But of course, at church, there was this emphasis where uh, sometimes after the worship service, the pastor would have us all pray in gibberish, you know, the mm. whole congregation out loud. And he would say, let's just pray in tongues for the next five minutes or something like that. And you'd hear the whole congregation just cackling like chickens. Mm. Um and anyway, so uh, so that was part of the practice, and I think that started me on the road of doing it more. Um, then later on, the second charismatic church that I joined, there was quite an emphasis there, and there was more a there was a very sober uh, uh, focus on holiness and and the gospel of repentance. But with it came, of course, tongues and miracles and everything like that. And you you mostly hear about miracles, you mostly hear about healings, you never really see it. 
um, you do it yourself, you lay hands on people, you pray for things, and it doesn't really happen, but you believe it's going to happen, and other people believe it's going to happen. So there's a lot of psychosomatic um, experiences that go on in charismatic churches, and a lot of people based on that would say, I've seen a lot of things, you can't convince me otherwise. Mm. And I think that connects very much to how um, Buddhists and Hindus that have had their third eye awakened, mm -hmm. uh, they act like that too. I've experienced, they would say, God through the experience, and you can't convince me otherwise. In our last video that Robin and I did on the Toronto Blessing, we showed a clip of a woman who was a, an, a yoga instructor. And she was talking, that, yeah. yeah, she was talking about her experience uh, in her meditation practice and how she bursted out in laughter and how she had this, this, in, div, this almost divine quality of, of, of joy and peace. This stuff is, and that's the, and that's the thing. How do you, how do you, or what do you base that experience on? If other mm. religions are doing the same thing, if they are, yeah. uh, you, you know, even speaking and there, there's there's evidence that that other religions and are even speaking in, in uh, you know, gibberish, just like those who, who you know, in, in, within the charismatic church. The point is, is that you have to have something to base, something objective, something solid to base that experience on. And um, yeah. almost everyone that I have dealt with or that I've watched, uh, you know, uh, doing research on the tongues movement and all that other stuff is they, they base their experience by their experience. Well, I know what I've seen. I know I've, I've watched yeah. this. I've seen this. I've seen it happen. Um, in another video, I showed an older clip of a, of a, a guru who had in a woman who had experienced Shaktipat, she had uh, had uh, an impartation from a guru. Uh, his consciousness is what she said was placed inside of her. And right. she experienced this change of life. I mean, it's so, so you can't, that's what really um, needs to convince folks is that you, there's got to be something solid, something objective to place your experience in. And it may be the, you know, it, God may be speaking to you well enough, but how do you know it's God for sure? You know, that, that's exactly. my, yeah. yeah. So anyway, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I, 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 I wanted to interject there and just kind of give my thoughts on that. Absolutely. No, I think that's extremely useful. And it's, it's once people start understanding that, you can see the same with Sufi Muslims. You can see mm. the same with Hindus and Buddhists. Um, they have this literally the same manifestations, laughing, jerking, shaking. Like, you know, when Justin Peters uh, first came out with his uh, dangerous doctrines and the mangled manifestations, it, it struck me that, you know, the people that have uh, tongues and visions and dreams and erratic laughter and jerking and shaking and uh, all those things, uh, my first answer in my mind was charismatics. And mm -hmm. then he said, no, it's actually Hindus. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and yeah. you find the same, same thing in Sufi Islam. Um, and that struck me uh, regarding guys like Kenneth Copeland. Um, you know, they spoke in exactly the, or they speak in exactly the same tongues as I did. And mm -hmm. that uh, uh, became a point of concern for me because I thought to myself, if I'm filled with the Holy Spirit and they're, speaking in exactly the same tongues, it sounds the same, it wor works the same, it manifests the same. What? How do I have the real Holy Spirit, but they not, um, or vice versa? And so I thought to myself, Kenneth Copeland does not show any, um, any godly fruit. Uh, you know, there's a lot of concern, there's a lot of bad theology, a lot of blasphemy. How can someone filled with the Holy Spirit blaspheme Christ like that? Mm -hmm. And then I thought to myself, but I speak in those types of tongues. So what makes mine better or different? So that was a point of concern for me. It was it was uh, one of the first uh, parts of the crowbar being pushed under my uh, doctrine mm -hmm. there. Um, yeah. All right. So um, let's uh, let's move on now, just a minute, and let's talk about Ray Comfort and your uh, your first experience with Ray Comfort and how you came to. Um, uh, you know, you're talking about the crowbar there, how God began to pry you out uh, of the charismatic movement. Right. Yeah. Um, actually, the charismatic church I was in, um, the 
I think it was, yeah, it was one of the pastors. Um, might have even been the main pastor there, discovered uh, where the master clip online and he was intrigued by this. He really liked it. And he, he preached some solid, some solid sermons. He, he made no bones about the fact that God is holy, sin is sin, Jesus is Lord, you know, good, uh, good theological points that he s stood by. Um, and anyway, so he, uh, he introduced the other pastors to way of the master and we got permission uh, back then uh, as a charismatic church uh, or, or just as a as a church movement to copy their uh, season one where the master the training sessions and so uh, it was distributed through all the cell groups and so our cell group one night uh, watched the uh, uh, wjd what did jesus do dvd uh, from ray comfort and um i was struck by that i, I remember hearing this question for the first time have you ever told a lie mm. <laughs> Yeah, it's bad accent. But anyway, uh, have you ever told a lie? And um, it struck me and I could not escape it. I thought to myself, I have lied and I cannot deny it. And I cannot deny it. Okay, that was mm -hmm. just that inner corner feeling. You cannot escape. And um, obviously that was true to God's word. His laws written on our conscience, his laws written on our hearts. And so that struck me and I started thinking to myself, um, I'm guilty before God and I need to get it fixed. That was the growing understanding. Um, and anyway, so what it did for me, uh, you know, cutting a long story short, because it's a long story there, but cutting a long story short, what it did for me was to get me to understand that I need to be right with God. If I'm going to believe in Christ, if I'm going to confess Jesus as Lord, if I believe that he, according to the scriptures, died on the cross for our sins, he was buried. He rose from the dead the third day, according to the scriptures. If I'm going to stand by that, then I cannot live an unholy life. I cannot play with sin. And so that was what God used um, to to open my understanding to my own personal holiness in the first place. And am I truly right with him? And then after that, uh, one of my cell leaders in church, he said to me, listen, if you really believe this gospel, then start preaching it. Um and so I moved to another town. I got work in another town at that stage. And my life was in quite a bit of turmoil. I uh, was in a deep depression at that stage. And in that environment, I started preaching the gospel. Um, th thankfully, a friend of mine who was a pastor at that specific congregation, um, also still charismatic church, but this guy is a solid theologian. He, he understands biblical exegesis, and he encouraged us to uh, watch Way of the Master, and he used it in the training for evangelism. Anyway, so I ended up with a very hard-hearted atheist being one of the first people, one of the first people I witnessed to, because I felt confident after watching Ray Comfort's uh, video on how to interact with atheists and how to share the gospel properly. So I did this with this very hard-hearted man. And uh, when we got to, to the adultery commandment, he said, okay, I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I, I uh, tried to cram the gospel in there as he was leaving. It was quite comical. Um, he was the pool guy. And at that stage I was uh, helping with the garden service. I got jobs doing garden services and, you know, in a specific town and anyway so um he was leaving and i i said to him sir there's one god he's the father and the son and the holy spirit and he loves you and his son died for your sins and you need to <laughs> repent i can't re exactly remember what i ended it with but i tried to cram the gospel in as he was mm -hmm. leaving so that emboldened me and of course if you preach the gospel if you preach the biblical gospel to others then you are going to want to obey that gospel I mean, once you've taken someone through lying, stealing, looking with lust, blasphemy, you know, you want to tackle those own thing, those things in your own life. Mm -hmm. So that made a huge difference. And I think the swinging point or the turning point for me out of uh, word faith theology and out of tongues and all that stuff was the biblical gospel. That was the crowbar, I believe, that God used to take the lid off this deception. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. All right, so let's uh, let's talk really quickly uh, about your first encounter with a cessationist and uh, how that kind of got you thinking. And because um, you said that the reading your Bible and the way the Master was that crowbar that kind of took you, and and, and so God also used uh, this uh, this person here that you had an encounter with, and and I guess if I remember correctly, he was at the campsite you were working at, um, and and uh, speaking right. there, and you were going to try to you actually had a word from God that uh <laughs> you were going to give him so let, let's uh let's talk about that just for a minute 
Right. Yeah. So I was I was doing uh, campsite maintenance at this campsite. It was also the church, the charismatic church I was uh, part of. It was their business uh, side. Um, lovely campsite. Uh, and uh, anyway, so this church group came for a camp because that was a regular thing. Church groups from all over would come and have their retreats there, weekend seminars, whatever. And so this uh, cessationist congregation, they came and they had their retreat there the weekend. And I was immediately annoyed because I thought, <laughs> I'm the iPad here. I've got all the upgrades. <laughs> this uh, manual uh, typewriter with this black and white ink cessationist. You know, that was my oh, thinking. I didn't that's, think a then, I didn't think... <laughs> that's a good analogy. That's a really good <laughs> analogy. Yeah, back then I didn't think uh, typewriter and iPad, but that was the inference. You know, <laughs> I've got all the upgrades. I've got the yeah. tech. You know, there you go. Um, I'm in the know. You know, that's what I thought. But anyway, so um, I was annoyed with this guy, and his name was Shamil. Um, and, uh, anyway, so of course that's a derivative of Samuel or, uh, in English, it would simply be Samuel. Um, but anyway, so his name was Shamil, very humble guy. Um, he's the kind of guy that when he approached you, you got the idea that he, he cares, you know, he's, mm -hmm. he's got, mm -hmm. he had that demeanor anyway. So I went to him and, uh, I was just under my breath praying in gibberish, you know, praying in tongues. Um, and I wanted to get a word for him in my, my whole angle was I'm going to show this guy the, the power of God. I'm going to show him this dynamic that I have that he should have, you know. And so um, I was praying in gibberish under my breath. And then I did get a, I don't know, a slight feeling, I suppose. And I said to him, um, I've got a word for you. And um, I said, I believe that the Lord wants you or is going to raise you up to be like Samuel. You're going to worship him like Samuel. Yeah. So of course you don't need, you know, a word from God uh, you know, everything, every, yeah, everything we are and everything we have comes from God. He gives us life and breath and everything. So, uh, there's nothing we do on, on our own, but I mean that you didn't need, um, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, lo it's logical to assume that if his name is Shamil, meaning Samuel, it's easy to see that I could come up with a word like that for him. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was on the fly thing because at that stage, Bethel's influence was just, just about coming into the church that I was in. And I wow. never liked Bethel. I, I saw Bill Johnson's uh, furious love DVD, the first DVD we ever saw. And I was appalled, but anyway, mm. I digress. So, um, that just started there. And the notion that you get a word for people in evangelism, that this is somehow uh, reaching out that that notion was starting to rise up there and anyway so i gave this guy this word and i said that i believe that you're going to be raised up to worship god like samuel and i could see this guy did not believe me he did not receive it but he very graciously and very humbly just said to me thank you i'm trying to mimic his whole body language mm -hmm. the way he's mm -hmm. literally like thank you and I, and I was I was dumbstruck because I was ready to take up the sword and the club there, you know, and just say, you need to be filled. You know, you, you need this. So perhaps you thought he was going to argue with you there and say and you were got You were ready. You you had your uh, you had your spiritual sword there ready to fight. And he was just like, thank yeah. you very much. <laughs> yeah. And he was very humble. He was so humble about it that it struck me. It literally it conscience struck me. And I walked away there and I thought to myself do I really have the Holy Spirit? That was my thought. You know, do I really have the Holy Spirit? Because I knew how arrogant I was. And I knew what scripture says, love is patient, love is mm -hmm. kind, does not seek its own, is not boastful, you know? <laughs> so all these characteristics of, you know, or rather the, some of the fruit of the Holy Spirit, I could evidently see in this guy's life, this typewriter, cessationist, you know, he had that and I didn't. And I thought to myself, wait a minute, I pray in tongues like crazy. I pray in tongues constantly. I do it a lot because I get taught for, for the church that I was in would would tell you, you know, pray in the spirit, pray in the, that would be the, the, the buzz phrase. And so I did that a lot. And I was on my own a lot being on the campsite and doing, an, you know, work around the site there. Mm -hmm. I was on my own a lot. So the two things I would do that's at that time was quote scripture and pray in tongues. Mm -hmm. I would literally walk around quoting scripture to myself and praying in tongues. And so basically, yeah, that caused me to think about it and to think, is this really of the Holy Spirit? You know, because I saw the stinky fruit in my life there. Mm. And um, 
that that was a that was a big thing that caused me to to start halting. And it took me, I think, about five six years to get out of the whole tongues thing. And for a good stretch of about three years, I stopped praying in tongues. But I'm gonna just jump back slightly. The one day on the campsite, I was working. I was doing some stuff around the site and. I was praying in gibberish for close to three hours, between two and three hours, and I went for it. I really went for it, and I um, I conjured it up, you know. Mm -hmm. And I, I left it there, um, went on with my work, finished my day. Sorry, the next day, I went out to evangelize. The next day, I went down to the petrol garage, as we, uh, or the gas station, I think, in the states, you would say. <laughs> um, you know, so yeah, I went to the to the gas station, and I went to to witness to someone. I uh, took a tract with me, a tract or two, and I went to buy my stuff from the shop there. And I ended up speaking to a guy, sharing the gospel with him, you know, the biblical gospel, law and grace, took him through the commandments. He listened very humbly, um, uh, shared the gospel with him. He really received it. I, I'm not sure if I prayed with the guy or not, but it went extremely well. It went very well. It's one of those dream evangelism sessions where the guy listens and you deliver the package. And um, I walked home and I thought to myself, yep. I prayed in tongues yesterday, and mm. that's why it went so well. You know, that wow. was my thinking. Mm. And so, so, so then, on, so then, you're, what you're saying there then is that the tongues, the speaking in those tongues, gave you the power to evangelize. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was, okay. I just wanted to clarify that, that because, thinking. yeah. So, so, what what happened then? Did you so when you equated the two together? Did you think, oh man, maybe all of the other times that I've, you know, it kind of felt things fell flat. Maybe it's just because I hadn't didn't have that that power. Mm, the, I would say yes and no. Uh, it was kind of a just a it, the thought was basically I just need to do this a bit more or something mm. like that. Okay. Uh, I don't think I thought too deeply about it, other than hey, I prayed in tongues and it paid off. Gotcha. You know? um, that was my my thinking mostly. Because, of course, the word on the street in the charismatic circles is that John MacArthur, uh, uh, Paul Washer, you know, the cessationist preachers, that they, yes, their doctrine is sound regarding uh, righteousness and regarding salvation, but be careful because they don't have the Holy Spirit. That's literally what the church I was in would say about John MacArthur, or they limit the Holy Spirit at best. Mm -hmm. Um and I thought to myself, you know, I'm starting to listen to Paul Washer being convicted out of my socks. I'm starting to listen to John MacArthur, you know, very cautiously. But all I discovered when I started listening to John MacArthur was good doctrine and biblical truth. And I thought to myself, wait a minute, uh, or rather, this, this was the thinking that governed uh, my thinking at that stage. I don't know exactly what I thought, but the thinking that governed my thinking was, <laughs> same thinking a lot. That's was um, that God the Holy Spirit wrote Scripture. I mean, what does Hebrews say? Uh, what does what do Timothy say? Um, every Scripture is breathed out by God and useful, in, for, useful for instruction, reproof, training in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped unto every good work. So Scripture is God's speaking. It's not man's idea about God. It's God speaking to man by his Holy Spirit through people. I mean, mm -hmm. that's what Peter says. The holy men of old did not write as they saw fit, um, but as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So every, every Scripture from Genesis to Revelation is God's Word. It's the Holy Spirit's anointed, powerful Word. But in a charismatic setting, you get taught that there's the Logos and there's the Rhema. And the Logos is good. The Logos is seed form. Uh, but it's not really alive until the rhema comes along. So you can have the logos as a kind of a seed form stagnant thing, but once once the rhema comes, then things happen. Mm. You know, and so there's this distinction in charismatic circles that you need the rhema. That's what you want to seek after. Uh, the logos is basic. Okay, so um, the rhema, the, the rhema is God speaking to you personally. The logos is the word of yeah. God. Is the written word. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, and the rhema can also by your more uh, responsible charismatics by your more um, and, and I do want to just for any charismatics watching um, as a former charismatic I'm not trying to be insensitive and I'm not mm. trying to be belittling um, I think people must also realize that once you come out of a movement that you realize has deceived you maybe not intentionally but a movement that has a lot of deception woven into it you kind of have a disdain for it. So it's not that we're trying to be nasty for the sake of being nasty, but you do have kind of a bad taste in your mouth about mm -hmm. charismatic doctrine. So if it comes across a bit 
a bit uh, heated or nasty. That's not the intention. The intention is to say, God, the Holy Spirit wrote scripture. And that unless we're obeying scripture, we cannot be sure whether we're truly obeying God, because we, the only thing we know God says for sure is Genesis to Revelation. Yeah. Um, so I, I hope that helps any, any charismatic uh, friends that would be watching this. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, so the, the idea is that you must have the rhema. And that is the alive thing. And, and the inference is also, yes, God can make the scripture rhema to you. It can be logos, but then it can also be rhema, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. So you, it was through listening to uh, pastors like John MacArthur that kind of led you out of the movement. Now, what uh, the church that you go, how, how did, how, what, what church do you go to now? And uh, how were you, how were you introduced to that? that uh, specific congregation okay um i have my wife to thank for the the fact that we're in a solid church because when i w met my wife a couple of years ago um she basically uh, you know she had a couple of people that were uh, charismatic really speaking to her life uh, you know very fanciful things and she also got very disillusioned with charismatic theology because it let her down big time and so she realized this is not real um and that this is another story for another day for another day of course but long story short she basically when we met she said to me one of the first things she said to me is so what are you reading in scripture <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that's that a good stage, thing to say uh, to so yeah, yeah there you go yeah so um at that stage i was reading the gospel of mark and specifically i re recall the the verse i was reading was uh, or pondering on was um it said uh, the chief priests and the Pharisees sought uh, accusation against Jesus, but found none. You know, they mm -hmm. sought means to accuse him, but they found none. Um, and I, I, I said to her, that just stood out to me because, you know, he's divine, he's truthful, and they, they did their best and they couldn't find dirt on Jesus. You know, it just, that just impressed me. And it, I was thinking about that aspect. So anyway, so I told her that. And so she said, okay, great. And then we realized that we have a lot of theological truth in common. And that is how our relationship started. Yeah, so by God's grace, he gave me a godly wife, and I'm really grateful for her. Mm -hmm. And um, so, uh, hey, honey. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, um, yeah. So basically, she said to me, listen, we need to find a church that's not going to be talking in tongues. And at that stage, I was already well out of praying in tongues and things like that. And I was still attending now and then this charismatic church that I have now come out of. I was still attending church because I understood that I can't forsake church. I can't forsake the gathering of the believers. But at the mm -hmm. same time, it was a bittersweet thing because, you know, it, it's just you go to a service and then, yeah, and then there's, I'm just trying to be sensitive in how I, how I uh, say it because once again, there are some really godly people and some genuine. Yeah. You start going to a church that, uh, or you start hearing truth and you start believing truth, and you start reading your Bible, and you start seeing, then you begin to see differences. We are told to be Bereans. Folks, we are told yep. to be Bereans. We are told to, it, there's nothing wrong. Absolutely. And, and as a matter of fact, it's a command for us to check what our pastors, the pastors of our churches, are saying against the Word of God. We are commanded to do that. It's, we, you know, the Bereans were told that they were, they were more noble than the Thessalonians because they were checking everything that the Apostle Paul said was Scripture. And that's something that we should actually be doing. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, it's, it, it's something when you have been reading the Bible in its context and not, not reading, you know, it, you, know you, you memorize verses and things out of context, and then you, you're opening up the Word of God and you're, wait, wait a minute, Everything I thought about that verse that I'd been quoting out of context doesn't mean what it says. And you start seeing yeah. these things, and you start listening to people who are who are teaching the truth. Then when you're in church, you start hearing your pastor and you start looking at your Bible in the context. And, you know, that's a good thing when you check what your absolutely. pastor is saying with Scripture. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And many people just accept what they're told. Mm -hmm. I was there myself. And then, you know, even even pastors who don't, you know, who don't really preach esegetically and who make a lot of blunders theologically, even some of those pastors would say, don't just take my word for it, mm -hmm. read the Bible, see what the Bible says. So, you know, Absolutely. good on them for that. Yeah. And um, 
so yeah so basically my wife uh, said to me we need a church that's not gonna want to lay hands on us and talk in tongues and um so i started looking for a good reformed cessationist congregation and um so we found actually my one friend who's a, a, a theologian um, who left the same church, the same charismatic <clears throat> church a couple of years before me because he just really had enough. And uh, he's a he's a very keen mind and um, he's a Greek scholar and stuff. So he understands theology. And um, he he um, actually tipped me off that there was a, a church in my town uh, called um, Stellenbosch Bible Church. Um, anyway, I was still back back there it was still in Stellenbosch a little town here but anyway so um I joined that church I I, I phoned the pastor great guy we're still friends to till today he's the guy who married us by the way so that's awesome but um so anyways so I, I phoned him and I said to him listen I'm I'm from a charismatic background but I'm cessationist and I really agree with the doctrines of cessationism um and we started a conversation. He was pleasantly surprised. And so we started attending that church. Uh, once my wife returned into the country, she was teaching in another country. And once she returned and, um, you know, we got married and everything, uh, you know, we started attending this church. And then as we moved, we needed to find another congregation simply because of the distance. Mm -hmm. So we are now with Living Hope Bible Church. Uh, both the pastors from Stellenbosch Bible Church and uh, Living Hope, are, they studied at John MacArthur Seminary. And uh, really great guys, really respect them, and I honor the work that they do, uh, that mm. God is doing through them. And um, yeah, so heads up, to, uh, not heads up, that's the word, thumbs up. Thumbs up, there you go. <laughs> that was good. Heads up. Hey, heads up, thumbs up, you know, hey, what, you know, whatever. So, okay, so before we end here, I do want to say quickly that when we call ourselves cessationists, it does not mean that we don't believe in in the gifts. We don't believe, I mean, and I mean we, what we believe is that the apostolic sign gifts have ceased, but we still believe the Holy Spirit gives gifts, um, the gift of mm -hmm. teaching and, and, and other things like that, the gift of administration and these other gifts. But we don't believe that the sign gifts are in continuance today. They 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 were for a specific time, uh, and they were uh, primarily, uh, you know, uh, given in order to advance uh, the gospel from Israel or from Jerusalem to the utter, uttermost parts of the of the world. So. We do believe that the Holy Spirit still works. I believe that God heals. Absolutely. I believe that God heals today. I just don't believe Absolutely. he heals through these these faith healers that lay their hands on people. There have been many times that I that I've prayed, you know, and asked God to, you know, uh, heal people. I do that all the time. Every time somebody that I know and love is sick, I pray for them that God would heal them, specifically heal them. And uh, God yeah. answers prayer. I've seen God answer prayer in my own life. I've seen him answer prayer in, in, in my, you know, my wife's life. I've seen him answer prayer in other people's lives. We're not saying that we don't believe in miracles because the greatest yeah. miracle in the world is when you know, uh, the, uh, the gospel is being preached and the Holy Spirit, uh, turns the heart of someone to believe the gospel. That's an incredible, that's the greatest Amen. miracle of all. So we yeah. don't, you know, it, it's not that we don't believe that God does the miraculous. What we believe is that the sign gifts, you know, tongues, prophecy, and gifts like that have ceased. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it, it's Paul, yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I was going to say one more thing. Paul says uh -huh. in, in Romans 1.16 that uh, the gospel itself, the preaching of the gospel, is the power of God for salvation to all Amen. who believe. So anyway, go ahead. Go, go ahead. I apologize. No, absolutely. Um, I fully agree because um, I think the important point is that God the Holy Spirit wrote Scripture. And mm -hmm. If I, if I look at my attitude toward the Holy Spirit previously and my attitude toward the Holy Spirit now, I'm, I'm very careful to acknowledge him as God, the Holy Spirit, because he's the third person of mm -hmm. the triune God. He is yeah. Yahweh, the Holy Spirit. And it, 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 it really um, annoyed me when in charismatic circles I saw and I had in my own life just a floppy attitude toward the Holy Spirit. I understood that he was God, but I had a, a floppy, sloppy attitude toward him. Mm -hmm. And it disgusted me. Um, some of the things I said uh, earlier in my life, uh, it, it disgusted me. Um, but anyway, I think the, the point that you're bringing across there is God, the Holy Spirit, wrote scripture. And um, a point that I think is very important is 
where is Christianity at? I believe it is in reading God's word and obeying God's word. Uh, what is it, St. Peter? But grow in grace mm -hmm. and in the knowledge of our Lord yeah. and Savior, Jesus Christ. And if people were to just stop and think to themselves, how much effort has God placed into the writing, the documentation, the, 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 the canon of scripture? Mm -hmm. How much um, has he poured out his own life, you know, Jesus gave his own life to seal mm -hmm. the new covenant with his very own blood. Mm -hmm. These are the high things of God, the important yeah. things of God. Yeah. And if people are saying, yeah, yeah, God gave us the Bible, but he wants to speak to me personally because he's very, very concerned with my personal dreams and visions and desires, and he wants to make me great in the earth and all this nonsense that you get taught in word faith circles. Um, if people could just stop and say, but listen, how serious is God about his word about the mm -hmm. Bible? Be careful just to call it Dead Seed Form Logos. Yeah. That so we can't we can't rely on, you know, some inward impression or some prophecy that we think we've been given or a word of knowledge that we've been given from God and elevate that above scripture. We just can't do it. Thank you That's so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. And I really believe that your story is going to be helpful, especially for someone who and, and I know there are people who are listening in the same exact situation that you were in. Something isn't right. There's something that's not right. I really want God. I really desire a relationship with him. I really desire um, to know him. But there's just something that I'm hearing that isn't right. And hopefully, and I, I don't mean not just hopefully, I know that your testimony, your story is going to help those who might be sitting on the fence. So thank you very much for joining me, brother. You're very welcome, and thank you for having me. It was a great uh, privilege. It was really nice to 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 have the session with you. And mm. uh, yeah, I hope yeah, may the Lord use this for His glory. Absolutely, and we will get together and do this again. That would be. Great. And this time we'll talk about we'll talk about uh, some charismatic theology, maybe, and we'll 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 maybe we'll do some uh, try to do some debunking there. That would be good. That would All be right. Great. All right, brother. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. God Thanks bless. Thanks for having me.